Hello students, uh, this is our first of a series of narrated PowerPoints um, where turned into quick time movies. So all you have to do is watch them and they'll walk through the PowerPoint. You can follow along in your notes. The, the notes follow basically the same format as the PowerPoint. The introductory material, you have a pretty full set of notes as we go into a survey of the contents of Corinthians. You have a little bit less notes and we'll fill in those blanks as we go through with the PowerPoint. Okay, our study is in 1 Corinthians. I've given the theme of 1 Corinthians as correction for an immature church. Uh, Paul is writing to a church, a church that he founded um, in southern Greece, um, but a church where many of the members have come from difficult pagan backgrounds and they're struggling in a whole variety of ways. They're struggling with um, disunity, they're struggling with immorality, they're struggling with uh, lawsuits, they're suing each other, they're struggling with marriage issues. And so, um, whereas some of Paul's letters are written to very strong, thriving churches, uh, Corinthians, 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians are, are written to a church that is really struggling in many ways at odds with Paul, as well as at odds with itself. Um, very relevant to the church today because of some of the challenges and struggles that we face today. Uh, let's start off by talking about a little bit about the, the location of Corinth, which helps to explain some of the issues that the Corinthians were going through. Uh, Corinth as a city was a major commercial crossroads in the ancient world. Here's a map of southern Greece, and you can see Corinth there in the middle. Uh, southern Greece is known as Achaia. Northern Greece is Macedonia, and in southern Achaia is this Peloponnese, so this massive peninsula. You can see it there, um, just to the um, west of Athens. And Corinth lays on this um, narrow isthmus of the Peloponnese, connecting the mainland, or uh, northern Greece, with the Peloponnese. And so because it was this narrow isthmus, it's, it's an important strategic location, strategic militarily and strategic commercially as well. Here's a close-up of the isthmus. You can see it there. And there is ancient Corinth right there. There is Lycaon, which was the, the um, port to the north and the west of Corinth. And Cancrea is the port to the south and east on the Saronic Gulf. Um, Lycaea is on the Corinthian Gulf, and the Cancre uh, is on the Saronic Gulf. If you went further out in that direction, you would go into the Aegean Sea, there on the southeast. If you went further to the left, you'd go in the Adriatic Sea. So this connected two major seas, two large gulfs, and two major seas. Um, ships that did not want to go around the Peloponnese, it was a dangerous uh, ship um, trip around there, um, would actually cross over. Um, now there was no canal in the ancient world. The Romans tried to build a canal and failed, uh, but what they would do is they would often drag their ships over on this track known as the Diochkos. You can see that there um, in the picture. Uh, here's a picture from today. In modern times they did build a canal and there's a canal three and a half miles across there and ships pass through that regularly. But as I said, the Romans attempted to and failed to build a canal. But they did have this thing called the Diochus. Now this is a drawing. You can see on the right there's a drawing of how they would bring ships over. They would uh, load ships onto um, carts and then there was a track, kind of like a railroad track. Um, and they would use slaves to drag these ships across from one port to the other. Um, um, other times they would simply unload the cargo and, and carry the cargo across on carts and load it on a new ship, but it meant at times the ships were not too large that they would, they would drag them over. Um, you can see there on the left uh, that track that is actually a modern picture of the Diaca. Still, you can still see the evidence of that track today. Um, being this key strategic location, the city of Corinth was a thriving commercial and cultural center, um, a crossroads of trade, a crossroads of business. Um, here's some pictures from the archaeological site. Corinth is a fabulous archaeological site today. Here is the forum, sort of the center, government, governmental center of Corinth. Uh, Corinth also uh, boasted all of the amenities of a major city. 
There was a, a theater that held something like 3,000 people, the Odium Indoor Theater. Here is a, a picture of one of the major squares, the Perrine Fountain um, at Corinth. An artist has attempted to draw what Corinth looked like, at least downtown Corinth, uh, the center of Corinth in Paul's day. You can see to the right the large outdoor theater. That theater would hold as much as 20,000 people. Um, and then just above it, the Odeon or the indoor theater that would hold 3,000 or so. Um, so Corinth was a major city, um, well-known, popular city to visit. It had Olympic or, or um, athletic games, much like the Olympics. There were, they, these were called the Pan-Hellenic Games at several key locations. We know about the Olympics, but these were at several key locations around sorry, phone ringing, <laughs> several key locations located throughout uh, Greece and the Olympic or the um, athletic games um, at Corinth were second only to the great Olympic games. Uh, the city was also a city of great diversity in terms of religion. Um, and that brings us next to the moral condition of the city. Um, rampant idolatry, there were pagan temples throughout the city. Here's the temple of Octavia. Uh, worship of the emperor would take place in the temple of Octavia. Uh, here is the temple of Apollo, a key central point in the city. Behind it is the Acrocorinth. I'll talk about that in just a moment. So pagan temples throughout the city. When Paul came to the city and preached the gospel, he had to contend with um, lots of idolatry. Um, not only lots of idolatry, but lots of immorality. Um, the the temple at the top of this Acrocorinth, this natural defense. I should have mentioned that the Acrocorinth is a, a mountain just beside Corinth, and it was a natural defense for Corinth. Um, in times of war, the people could flee up to the top. There was something of a fortress there. Um, and also uh, the Temple of Aphrodite, legendary uh, Temple of Aphrodite. Um, in the ancient world, you may have heard the, the, the stories that the temple had a thousand sacred prostitutes Prostitutes were often a part of pagan religious rituals, and the Temple of Aphrodite had a thousand prostitutes. Now, we have to be cautious, though, because that wasn't in the time of Paul. Uh, the city of Corinth, the ancient city of Corinth, the Greek city, was destroyed by the Romans in 146 BC. They revolted against the Romans, and the Romans moved in and destroyed the city. And the city basically lay in ruins for a hundred years. Um, and so at the end of that 100 years, Julius Caesar rebuilt the city in about 44 BC. So most of the statements about um, the immorality at Corinth are made with reference to ancient Corinth, or the old city, I should say. They're both, they're both ancient Corinth, but the old city of Corinth, the Greek city. But the Romans rebuilt the city, populated it primarily with um, Roman colonists, um, many from Rome, many retired soldiers, and, and so forth. Uh, but that doesn't mean that the city became a, a, um, a highly moral city as a key crossroads of trade, industry, entertainment. Um, it was its moral conditions were was still extremely negative, and Paul had to contend with this. Um, here's a statue of Dionysius, the god of wine and pleasure, uh, very much the epitome of what Corinth was in Paul's day. So we, what we can say for sure is that Corinth had all the struggles of a um, pagan city, all the struggles of a major metropolitan center. Some people have suggested that, um, that Corinth was something like a combination of Las Vegas, New York, Los Angeles, um, where, where, of course, you've got incredible diversity of population and all the challenges that come with that. All right, let's move next of all to the founding um, of the church at Corinth. Paul actually founded the church on his second missionary journey. Here's a map of that journey. Um, Paul had started churches in Galatia on his first missionary journey. Galatia is, is located in central Turkey. Let me orient you to this map. On the, on the right side of the map is what's modern-day Turkey, known as Asia Minor in Paul's days. To the left of the map, you can see on the north is Macedonia, that's northern Greece. In the south is Achaia. Uh, Paul started churches in Galatia on his first missionary journey. On his second, he, he went there with Barnabas, if you remember, and John Mark. On his second missionary journey, a conflict arose between Paul and Barnabas over whether to take John Mark. 
And so they separated, and Paul took Silas instead, visited those churches in Galatia, that would just be to the right of what you're seeing on the map, um, and then came across. He wanted to go into um, Asia um, on the west side of Turkey, but the book of Acts says that the Spirit would not permit him to go there, so he tried to turn north into what is known as Bithynia, north of that, and the Spirit um, prevented him from doing that. And then he was in the city of Troas, just on the western border of, of modern Turkey, uh, Asia Minor, and he had a vision. A vision, and in this vision, a man from Macedonia was beckoning him to come over across. So you can see on the map, he crossed over, went to the city of Philippi, where he started the church at Philippi. You might remember the story of the Philippian jailer of Lydia, who came to Christ first and opened her home to Paul, and then the Philippian jailer, um, after Paul was arrested for casting out a demon from a, a demon-possessed uh, fortune-telling girl, um, and then the Philippian jailer was saved, and then Paul was asked to leave by the city officials, but the church was started. That church in Philippi would become one of Paul's closest churches. Paul then went on to Thessalonica, started the church in Thessalonica, Persecution broke out against him, so he moved on to Berea. More positive experience at Berea. Um, the Jews there were more receptive to the gospel. You might have heard of uh, Bereans. They, they searched the scriptures daily to see whether what Paul said was true. Um, but persecution followed him there as the Jews from Thessalonica came and ran him out of town of Berea, in Berea. So he, re he went south to Athens. This is where, in Acts chapter 17... Paul gave his famous Mars Hill Address in Athens. Um, after being there for a time, he went on to Corinth, and he started the church at Corinth. You can see there the points at the bottom of the page there. Uh, Paul spent 18 months in Corinth. That is longer than any other church except for Ephesus. He spent three years in Ephesus on his third missionary journey. This, again, is Paul's second missionary journey. Um, while there, he worked with Aquila and Priscilla, a Jewish couple from Rome. Um, then he moved from the synagogue where he was preaching to the lecture hall of Titius Justice. Um, and let me let me just read. I'm in Act. Um, I'm in Acts chapter 18, and let me read about the founding of the church at Corinth. Acts 18:1. After this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. There he met a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had ordered all Jews to leave Rome. Paul went to see them, and because he was a tent maker, as they were, he stayed and worked with them. Every Sabbath he reasoned in the synagogue, trying to persuade Jews and Greeks. When Silas and Timothy came from Macedonia, Paul had sent them back to check on the churches in Berea and Thessalonica. Paul devoted himself exclusively to preaching, testifying to the Jews that Jesus was the Messiah. But when they opposed Paul and became abusive, he shook out his clothes in protest and said to them, Your blood be on your heads. I am innocent of it. From now on I will go to the Gentiles. Then Paul left the synagogue and went next door to the house of Titius Justus, a worshiper of God. Crispus, the synagogue leader, and his entire household believed in the Lord, and many of the Corinthians who heard Paul believed and were baptized. One night the Lord spoke to Paul in a vision, Do not be afraid. Keep on speaking. Do not be silent, for I am with you. And no one is going to attack and harm you, because I have many people in this city. So Paul stayed in Corinth for a year and a half, teaching them the word of God. So for 18 months he established the church in Corinth. There's one other key event. There's one other key event I want to mention with reference to Corinth, and that's the following passage. Let me read it, and then I'll comment on it. I'm in again. I'm in Acts chapter 18, verse 12. When Gallio was proconsul of Achaia, the Jews of Corinth made a united attack on Paul and brought him to the place of judgment. That place of judgment is the bema seat, the the central um, place where the the highest city official, the judge, would sit and and make judgments. Uh, this man, I'm continuing on in verse 13, uh, this man they charged is persuading the people to worship God in ways contrary to the law. Just as Paul was about to speak, Gallio said to them, 
If you Jews were making a complaint about some misdemeanor or serious crime, it would be reasonable for me to listen to you. But since it involves questions about words and names and your own law, settle the matter yourself. I will not be a judge of such things. So he drove them off. Then the crowd there turned on Sosthenes, the synagogue leader, and beat him in front of the proconsul. And Gallio showed no concern uh, whatsoever. Now this is a significant episode for a couple of reasons. One is that Gallio was only the proconsul of, um, of Achaia for a short time, for about a year. And so we can date Paul's letters by this, by this event. We know when Paul was in Corinth, so we can move backwards find out when he was in other places and forwards and find out where he went from here. So this is a key point. Um, sometimes it's hard to identify the chronology. You may have, you may have heard that we have trouble even, even dating Jesus' ministry. Some think it was 27 uh, to 30 AD. Some people think it was 80, 30 to 33. Um, we just don't have a lot of key indicators to know exactly when it was. Um, so it's hard to date Paul's ministry as well, but one way we can do that is this reference to Gallio. But there's something else here as well. And notice what Gallio says. Um, the Jews um, oppose Paul and bring him before the government. And Gallio basically says that Christianity, Paul's religion, worshiping Jesus the Messiah, is really just another form of Judaism. He said, you're just fighting over um, issues of your law. Now, by being identified with Judaism, um, Christianity received the same protection that um, Judaism received under Roman law. Judaism was a special, had a special case in the Roman world where um, Jews were allowed to worship the one true God. Not, they didn't have to worship Caesar, which everyone else was expected to do, and they were protected for various reasons. And so, the for a time the Christians had that same protection. And, and Gallio's decree sort of affirms that idea that, that Christianity is still being viewed at this time as just one sect, one group within Judaism. All right, there's a brief summary of the, of the city of Corinth and Paul's establishment of the church. In our next PowerPoint, we'll talk about the historical context of the Corinthian letters.